with the hope that those observations are implemented in such a way that it helps teachers improve for our students. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, the other thing that has happened this year is that obviously we cannot have teacher VAM scores because we did not have test results um, from last year. And so what that does is make every single teacher, whether they're a VAM teacher or non-VAM teacher, have 50% of their total evaluation scores ranked based on SLTs. Um, I do want to just put in a note in there that school VAM scores will be available, but not individual teacher VAM scores because we have no way to trace the students um, uh, to that teacher in terms of, of growth in the way that we typically can. Um, so I know that that's then got us to why we're here today. Um, so, you know, the, the reason for student learning targets is that it's really good practice when it's done well. We want to know what our goals are for our students. We want to move the needle for our students so that they're on level and they're learning and they're getting high quality instruction. Um, I think the formula, if I could get anything across in, in the five minutes I'll spend with you today, it would be that in any circumstance, this is the formula that we recommend being used, which is X outcome in X amount of time on X assessment for X number of students. What we don't wanna have happen is for this um, grouping of students to, for example, exclude special ed students or exclude a group of students who might typically be lower performing in, in the classes. What we do wanna say is that we know, for example, some of you may not have even opened the schools yet due to the natural disasters that have happened in our state. Or we know that, um, you know, there may be this kind of heterogeneous blend of a teacher who's working with one group virtually and then they switch to another group in person. And so what we wanna express is that for teacher student learning targets, pick the group of students that we know that the teacher will have for the longest amount of time Choose an assessment that is already being used. We don't want the students to be over tested or to pick another test or another diagnostic that gets layered onto your workday. It should be SMART goals, right? And so you're picking something you're already using and making a growth goal based on diagnostic or other data that you will gather this school year. So that is good practice regardless of circumstance. And obviously this year, the way that you think about the amount of time or the way that you think about the grouping of students may need to be specific to your district or school systems needs this year. I'm gonna jump and I know that I just, I'm gonna keep going and I'll be very responsive to questions in the chat and then we'll have some Q&A time at the end as well. Um, but I'm gonna move into the leaders because this gets into a BSI um, change. So because we do not have SPS scores from last year, BSI has approved a couple of alternative ways that leaders or anyone identified as L in the evaluation component of CIS um, can create their student learning targets. <laughs> so, um, in current policy and in a typical year, one of those targets is based on the overall SPS score and another one of those targets is based on a component of the SPS score. So for this year only, leader SLTs can be comprised of formative goals that would follow almost the exact same format of the teacher. So X outcome in X amount of time on X assessment for X block of students. Um, this outcome could be something that is really important to your school initiatives for this year. It could include an attendance goal. It could be a subject area, um, but something that will move the needle forward in terms of your plans for your school. Or they can continue to be SPS related goals and you can use the SPS score from 2018, 2019 to set those goals. So that and the one observation, I'm just scrolling back here for you, are the two major BSE changes. And just really highlighting again, making really smart choices um, in terms of SLTs. Um, I wanna highlight a couple of resources for you, um, which is that we have the Compass Library and we're constantly updating it 
we have the rate of reliability training in there. There is an SLT assessment guide. Um, and in that guide, our content leads at the DOE have put in assessments that are suggested ideas. We get a lot of questions about how can we set an SLT because we don't have LEAP scores. And you know, in, in honor of what Kim said in the beginning, we actually encourage you to look outside of the LEAP because when VAM teachers set their SLTs based on the LEAP score, they're essentially doubling up um, the scoring um, based on LEAP alone. And so we really want you to look at an assessment that is meaningful to you and there is a guide available um, in the Compass Library right now that you can go to. Um, so I am going to stop sharing the screen, go into the chat and try to answer as we go and pass, um, pass the mic back to Kim over there. Thank you all so much. All right, thank you so very much. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our experts of excellence from the field now. Again, I'm still playing with the title. And what's gonna be really great is that each of their approaches um, really, really kind of echo and embody the essence of SLTs. And for each of them, um, a lot of their practices and their thinking and their thought process for SLTs, it hasn't changed even with COVID. And so um, as they start to speak, don't hesitate to share as much as you possibly um, want to in the chat box, and especially in terms of questions, because they're going to be helping us and assisting. Um, and then they're part of your network. They're part of your learning team. And so if you have any, any other questions, I'm sure that they would be happy to help. So I'm going to go ahead and, and take a look because I want to introduce each of them and I'll introduce once. So if you take a look here, uh, the first person who's going to speak with you uh, is Principal Brooke Nolte. If you get a chance to look at her website, I like the notes with Nolte section. And she, um, she's over in Bossier at Stockwell Place Elementary. And she's done incredible work with her school. Not only has she um, been in a, a variety of leadership roles from teaching to instructional coaching and assistant principal, uh, but recently in 2019, her school was a top gains honoree and also an equity honoree. The next person who's going to be speaking with us is Principal James Jackson, and he's at Port Allen High School. And he's got a lot of really great ideas about thinking through a block schedule. So that four by four schedule. Um, and that's such a unique space for a lot of our schools. And so everything that he's going to tell you is going to be helpful, even if that's not your schedule. We're also gonna hear from Torrance Williams, who's a principal and um, such an interesting professional journey in that he was a high school social studies teacher and then also an assistant principal and a principal. So now he works with students in an elementary school. So he's going to be able to share an experience from a lot of different areas about his thought process for the SLTs over the years, especially as he's never taught a tested subject. So his SLTs have always had to be more orga organic and authentic to the, to the environment. And then the last speaker for today is going to be Angèle Bourgeois, and she's um, our mistress of all trades, or Jane of all trades, in that she's currently an assistant principal, an ELA teacher, and a coach, and she's coming to us from, from St. Charles Al Alma, Alma Elementary, um, and she's going to be walking us through some really great ideas that she's got, especially in terms of, of how we can elevate the work of our subgroups. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Nolte, and you'll get us started. And again, if you have any questions for them or for us, we'll continue to look at the chat box. Ms. Nolte, can you say hi, just so that I don't feel nervous inside? Okay, and I don't know if anybody else can hear her, but I can't hear you just yet. No, not yet, but I can see you, so that's a step in the right direction. You may need to connect your mic and maybe turn up the volume.
Okay, no worries. So what's easy about this is that I could just I could just flip you next while we figure this out. So Mr. Jackson, are you here yet? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Would you mind kind of jumping in the game while Miss Nolte gets her, her mic ready and you can be our first speaker? Yes, you want me to share our thought process behind setting teacher SLTs or something different? No, that's exactly what I would like for you to do, sir. Okay, so we've kind of gone around the world with the way that we set SLTs uh, with teachers. Um, when SLTs first became a requirement, uh, we set SLTs based on a specific percentage of kids that we wanted to score at proficient. And there were some conversations about what was considered proficient. Uh, some people consider proficient mastery and above. Some people consider it basic and above. So we have to have conversations about that. Um, and we gradually increased our expectations from the proficiency expectation going from 60% of kids scoring basic or above to 70 and then to 80. Um, and that, that worked okay for us. Uh, but what was flawed about that process was that it didn't measure our value growth. Um, and so, you know, if I have a student who has consistently scored unsatisfactory in a teacher's mind, the likelihood of getting that kid to basic or mastery in one academic year is low. Um, so a teacher may not focus on that kid as much feeling that, hey, this is not a kid that I can get up. Once growth to mastery uh, targets started coming out, then we changed teacher SLTs, LEAP teachers specifically, to be based on the percentage of students that meet their expected growth target. And so what that did was that in emphasized each individual kid. So teachers sat down, they had to crunch data, they had to look at each kid in their class and say, okay, where has this kid historically scored before the kid came to me? And then if my job is to grow this kid at least one academic year while he or she is with me, if this kid has consistently scored unsatisfactory, I should at least be able to get him to approach and basic. If this kid, this kid has consistently scored advanced, this kid should continue to score advanced. If this kid has scored mastery, I should be able to get him to advance. So what that did was, like I said, it emphasized each individual student. Um, and with us being on a block schedule, um, just to tell you a little bit about us, we're on an accelerated block schedule where kids take five classes in the fall and then five new classes in the spring. So we have fall and spring SLTs. Um, instead of just, you know, one SLT for this class or this subgroup and another one for another class or another subgroup. So teachers set their SLTs based on their fall courses and then we revisit those SLTs before we leave for the Christmas break. And we adjust them as needed and make accommodations for things that may have happened um, as far as losing school days and things like that. And a year or two ago, we made a push to try to create some level of equity with regards to teacher SLT. So for example, you know, a PE teacher's SLT versus an algebra one teacher's SLT. You know, I think we'd all agree that there's probably a little bit more pressure on that algebra one teacher whose SLT is based on the standardized test score versus, you know, maybe an elective department teacher whose SLT is based on a teacher made exam or, or assessment. So we try our best to standardize SLTs as much as possible. Um, so we have teachers whose SLTs are based on LEAP. We have teachers whose SLTs are certifications. Um, so we've gotten to the point where about 90% of our teachers have SLTs based on something that's standardized uh, so that they can then drive their instruction geared towards whatever that standardized assessment is that's aligned to their course. And that's worked well for us and helped us to continue to grow. Um, I will say that this year we backed off a little bit on uh, focusing on growth targets just because the growth targets are now based on data that's two years old um, because so many of our students didn't take standardized tests in the 1920 school year because of COVID. Um, but we just kind of transitioned back just for this year with teachers just having a set percentage of students score at the basic and above level on league tests. Um, and then we'll go back to focusing 
more on growth with regards to SLTs next year. So we're still focusing on that growth, but just not in the form of SLTs. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. And I'm gonna keep you on another maybe two minutes if that's okay. Would you be able to give us some ideas? Because like you said, like that data is old now, right? Like it's super old. Um, so what are some areas you're looking into this year with your teachers? Could you give us some examples of some of the more, more formative assessment where you don't have standardized data that's available? Yeah, so we still received uh, growth targets um, about two weeks ago, and we are still looking at those growth targets and, and crunching those numbers because teachers still need to go through the process of looking at each of their individual kids. And again, this is specifically with regards to LEAP courses, which is the overwhelming minority of teachers on the high school campus, but something that I know we all as high school principals place an emphasis on. So we're still looking at growth targets. It's just with an understanding that the growth targets are based on student scores in the 18, 19 school year. Um, so, so it's a little flawed, but it's still good data to look at to see, okay, theoretically, did we grow this student one grade level based on where he or she was the last time they took a standardized test, which unfortunately was two years ago. Um, so we are still looking at that. Um, but teacher SLTs for LEAP courses. So for example, our Algebra 1 teacher's SLT is for 70% of our students to score basic or above. In a normal year, that would be 80. Uh, but we don't want teachers to feel undue pressure or it being unrealistic with the SLTs we're setting for our school population with us starting the school year off on a hybrid schedule, missing days because of hurricanes. So we want teachers to feel like they're being set up for success, especially in the fall with everything being as crazy as it has been. Uh, but to directly answer your question, Kim, uh, again, we have teachers with SLTs based on LEAP scores, CLEP scores, AP scores, ACT scores, certifications, um, and then we have a few teachers who may fall into a pool where they don't have a standardized assessment um, aligned to their course. Um, that would be maybe a quest for success teacher, um, maybe a technical writing or a business English teacher. Uh, so for those teachers, we do have uh, teacher created exams that of course we give them a set criteria of what those exams need to look like. Um, and then teachers SLTs are based on that. And it's usually 80% of the students will score at least 80% on their final exam. So it's kind of the 80, 80 rule. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. And stay um, on as long as you thank you. If you could stay on to the very end, sir, I'm that would sorry, be I'm awesome. Sorry. And there's a question for you in the chat box. I don't know if you're able to um, kind of take a look at that and respond, but thank you so much. It sounds like you're still um, having really rigorous expectations and that you're still having uh, teachers go through the thinking process of, of looking at the individual growth of individual students and moving them accordingly. And then it sounds like you're trying to still use um, whatever kind of norm reference data or standardized data that you already have at your disposal to be able to assist with that. So um, we're going to move on. I'm not sure if Ms. Nolte's microphone's working yet, so I'm going to give her a little bit more time and I'm going to move to Mr. Williams, yeah. um, if that's okay. So Mr. Williams, like a totally different approach, um, another really great one for people to be able to learn from, but could you tell us a little bit about your work and just to give you a heads up, um, at about 1233, I'll be um, asking you some kind of follow-up questions. So okay. Mr. Williams, if you're ready. Super, super. Well, hello, everybody. Um, as Kim said, I do come from lots of different perspectives. So I, will, I taught high school world geography and world history uh, and law studies the last three years that I was in the classroom. And then um, after that, I was a, uh, so I had no standardized tests for the six years that I was a high school teacher. And then I moved to uh, an elementary school, two through five, um, as an instructional coach uh, and was very much like pushed into leap testing and high stakes tests and everything. And very much like my performance depended on, um, you know, the performance of on the leap test and my performance and a whole lot of other people all kind of combined to make what we needed to do um, as far as SLTs come to life. Um, and then uh, last year I was promoted to principal. So now I'm the principal of uh, pre-K through one school. So again, no uh, standardized testing to connect to, uh, to 
SLTs. And so um, I'm going to share my screen with you just so I can show you um, what we used last year at my school for um, SLTs. Um, and of course, again, at this school, there are no, there is no standardized test. So um, we just kind of had to think about a lot of different things. Um, and so what we did, because I, I came from uh, an elementary school where uh, in, in terms of looking at SLTs, everything was based on like it, you had to grow. And so when I came to Baines Lower, I thought to myself, well, instead of um, taking the, the traditional approach, which is what I would have taken as, uh, as a teacher, I feel like all of our SLTs need to be based on growth, um, essentially. And so what you can see here on this document is how, like I, I give my teachers a frame and, um, and they have to just plug their, their data in. And so, um, and then if you look at the ranges, it's all about growth uh, at, this, at this level. And so keeping that in mind, um, last year, of course, we did do our traditional pre and post test um, uh, for this level. And it basically was about the standards. Um, and, and so like the, you know, like the test would have considered a, a wide range of different skills, both ELA and math. Um, so you'll see like right here, it was, it was um, written and it, and I told them, um, you need to either consider writing or grammar or letter naming or comprehension and take that one area and that be your focus um, for, for leak testing. I mean, excuse me, for SLTs. And then I did um, something similar for math. Um, like under math, it was number recognition, fluency, operation, so on and so forth. Um, and then they would do the same thing. The growth would, was all, the SLT was all about growth. Um, in terms of this year, I was kind of like scratching my head about what to do, but ultimately what we want to see, what I want to see, and I work very closely with the principal um, at my sister school, the two through five school. And so um, what we're going to do this year, and we'll probably do this from now on, is we're going to take a look at what, um, what is an area of weakness in ELA or an area and opportunity in ELA in third grade, and what's an area of opportunity in math in third grade, and we're gonna write our SLTs based upon something specific. So for example, when I was speaking to Ms. Lemoyne, who's the principal at Baines yesterday, she told me that um, in third grade and fourth grade, they have um, the biggest opportunities for growth in modeling and application on the LEAP test and um, analysis and reasoning. And so because of working with all of, you know, working with, with uh, two through five and now working with pre-K to one, I know that um, the, to get the, the kids to master that, they have to know what the RDW strategy is, like that, the read, draw, write strategy. If they can read it and uh, write it, that they, then they can do better on analysis and reasoning. If they can draw it, then they can do better, better on modeling and application. And so I, those are strategies that we use here. And so those are what we're going to focus on in math. Um, is we're gonna we're gonna write our SLT based on the RDW strategy, and the teachers are not gonna have to give another test. It's they're gonna use a test that they would give normally, and they're gonna look at and analyze um, how the kids did in in the RDW. Did they read it? Did they draw? Did they model? Um, did they write out their their um, answer? And so we're gonna look at a couple of those, and that's how we're gonna write our target um, for ELA. What we're gonna do is. Um, one of the biggest ones that they always struggle with is writing. So we're going to use for pre-K, for kindergarten and first grade, some strand of writing to write our SLT. And what that will do is it creates some continuity. And hopefully what we're doing is we're sending students better prepared. So when they get to third grade, those things are no longer issues. Like we're helping grow the student's knowledge, which is, which is what I essentially see the student learning target as being. Um, it's about how can we get the kids to the next level? Um, and it's not just one kid, it's all. Um, and we're able to monitor a lot of that because we, like one, what I wanna be able to offer parents is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Like every kid is getting the same thing. And so when we say all, we mean all. Um, and so every teacher in first grade writes the, it writes the same SLT just based upon their class's information. So like, you know, no one can dodge it. And if they're a special education teacher in first grade, then they use the same SLT just using their students' data. Um, now, in the past, I know, like when I was at the high school, I, we all wrote an SLT based on, like everybody in the entire school, nine through 12, had one SLT was the same, and it was based on ACT. 
like everybody had an ACT um, target and that was written by the administration and we all had to work together to do that. Um, when I say that um, this year we're going to use those weak strands in um, third grade, we're going to, that data is being drawn from Lexile and also from um, Leap360 data. So, um, so, you know, there's a host of different things that can be used. Wow, thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Williams. I think it's especially valued in the chat box, um, this kind of look at like vertical growth. And I think that that's yes. something that I've never thought of before in terms of like setting goals. And we talk about things like that, but you've actually made it super concrete. I um, also really appreciate that, like right there in the writing is the emphasis on growth. And I think about um, how powerful that is for a teacher to see, because we know we can grow kids, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. it's more nebulous, the further away the goal seems, but the, this, this target, is really, really uh, focused and, I don't know, has a lot of optimism in it too. So <laughs> thank you. Um, there may be some questions for you in the chat box. And then okay. certainly everybody on the call, if you have any questions for Torrance, uh, he will be happy to take those. So now I'm going to move us on. And I'm still going to circle back to Ms. Nolte. Um, she'll be our last speaker now. But uh, Ms. Bourgeois, are you ready to roll? I'm ready. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you so very much. So take it away. And then at about 1242, I'll be um, kind of wrapping up your comments and then uh, you can join us in the chat box too. Okay. So similar to Torrance, um, I am now at a pre-K um, to school as well. So there is no standardized testing. Um, we've taken a similar approach to really focus on individual students and um, growth um, individual student growth on our SLTs. So using a plethora of our diagnostic um, assessments as well as state mandated assessments and our district mandated assessments, we've gathered so much data to really determine um, a baseline, a starting point with that looking at each individual student understanding um, their retention or their level of mastery of the prerequisite st standards. Because while our SLTs will be based off of the current grade level standards that we've deemed priority standards. We know that there's a, a lot of those priority standards directly um, relate to or have prerequisites to the, the previous grade level. And we, because of the circumstances, a lot of our students, we didn't have, maybe they they missed the whole nine weeks of instruction. So we've identified those, um, those areas or the prerequisite standards that would need or correct, directly uh, relate to the current grade level priority standards that we will be um, utilizing. Similar to um, Torrance as well, we are going to be using for pre and post test, tests that we would, are they're administered in a standardized manner, but they're tests that we would typically use um, as pre and post test um, in a typical year. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share um, the options that we have right now discussed for pre-K through second um, and it lists the pre the pre test as well as the post test that we are um, planning on using. Okay, can you see it? Oops. There we go. So for ELA, um, these are the options that we have discussed and it's broken up by grade level. Uh, we know with K, our pre-K um, targets will be based off of our um, kindergarten readiness. And that's what they spend the majority of their year. And you see for ELA, um, it may be literature and information or letter sound identification. Um, this is measured using our, pre our district preschool kindergarten readiness checklist. Um, and it's we've it's progress monitored throughout the year. Um, within kindergarten, you see as well our pretest for the letter sound correspondence is a beginning of the year assessment that our district has created. However, on all the other options um, for K one and two, you will see that those are all uh, core knowledge skills assessments, um, and that's the curriculum that we use. So, like I said, those are assessments that we would typically use, analyze that data and drive instruction. So we're gonna be setting um, the goals for growth off of those. For math, it's a little bit different. Um, 
we're still going to be identifying those priority grade level standards. And then the assessments that we're going to use in addition to our um, diagnostic assessments, in addition to daily formative assessments, is um, ask, inspect assessments from Illuminate Ed. We are able to, once we um, identify the standard that we are going to be um, using for our target, for our student learning targets, we're able to um, develop a standardized assessment for pre and post that um, with all the items being specific to that grade level standard. With that too, it also gives us um, a guide to diagnose learning and diagnose errors to guide instruction um, as well. Um, what we're also doing, which is a little bit different from years past, we've traditionally done one grade, one um, student learning target for math, one student learning target for ELA that all grade level teachers would use. However, this year, we know that there's typically more than one priority standard in ELA and math. So what we're doing is really looking at the data and seeing, um, giving the teachers the autonomy to choose what is gonna be based off of, what is gonna be the best, um, or what, where is the student need greatest at? So looking at my group of students, I may see that 75%, I may have two teachers that 75% of the students are really struggling um, in first grade with addition and subtraction within 10, whereas two or three other ones, they may have that, but are, are struggling with place value. So they're gonna be um, being able to individualize their SLTs in that um, aspect. And then our, the same thing with um, ELA choosing a, we've identified the priority standards and it's really taking a look at the, your group of kids this year and what is, where's the greatest need at? Where's gonna be, um, what is the standard that we know that maybe they lack the prerequisites. And so that's what we've already started remediating with to build that foundation that we'll continue building this year's um, standards upon. Thank you so much. And actually, um, and just like talks with you, I really would love for you to share your thinking about um, about subgroups, about students um, that we may uh, not necessarily strive to prioritize, but perhaps that we should, because I think you had some really powerful thoughts on that. Would you be able to share? Yes, so that's kind of where the individualization, individualization for this comes from, is that while all students are gonna be included it may be a class-wide um, SLT that the, the teachers are writing for. It may be based off of a, a subgroup. So I'm, I'm choosing the target knowing that I need all of my students to, um, to master this grade level standard. However, a large portion of mine are what would be, you know, approaching basic. Um, you know, they still are lacking the previous mastery of the previous grade level standard that directly correlates with this one. And so I'm setting it based off of really the greatest need um, of some of my lowest performing students. Within that too, um, we do have some of our special education students that are included within that, um, within that who are in inclusion settings who are um, included within that SLT. Um, we've also, on in another case that I can think of right now, we have students that probably about 60% are, are doing really, really well and have shown based consistently with data um, that they will for sure be uh, mastering the grade level standard with no problem. So really if that's where the, the um, our growth levels or percentages of um, growth are gonna come where we know that those are gonna be a little bit larger. So we're gonna continue to meet, make sure that every student, we are reaching every student and every student is progressing. Um, so that's, it's not just stopping at the mat. When they show mastery, we're continuing to push them and challenge them um, so that they are more than ready and exposed to even the following year or the, the following grade level um, standards. Woo, amen to that. I'm sorry, I get so excited and I'm, I've been working on adulting consistently, but that makes me so excited because um, not only are you making um, really intentional effort, like laser-like focus on students with neurodiversities and with disabilities, but you're also really intentionally looking ahead to the upcoming standards for students who have already mastered content. And we know that sometimes when we don't talk about this nearly enough, students who are achieving um, um, at or above at, at speeds and rates that really excite us in our classrooms, we don't always do a really intentional job as teachers or as schools even to make sure that we continue to push all students and propel them forward. So I really love um, your thinking through that. And if you could take a look um, in the chat box and any, if you could share this document or anything you'd be willing to share 
I had a lot of um, inbox comments about how valuable this was, especially because of the use of assessments, um, like the class and district made assessments, the benchmark assessments. So yes, if you could share that and then um, turn attention to the chat if you, if you can, that would be sure. awesome. All right, and then I'm hoping that Miss Nolte is ready to go because Miss Nolte makes me so excited. Um, I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> so if you could go ahead, it sounds like your sound is working. Can you hear me? I can. And it's Yay! just it's a bell. Okay. Well, um, hi, I'm the principal um, at Stockwell Place Elementary. And um, like Kimberly said earlier, I uh, came to Stockwell Place Elementary as the instructional coach, and then I became the assistant principal, and now I'm the principal. So um, this is my sixth year here, and I've um, kind of had every role here. Um, I even did my student teaching here when I uh, was first out of college. So I've kind of come full circle here. Um, and I just kind of wanted to share our SLT journey. Um, Stockwell Place Elementary is a Blue Ribbon school. We're an A-rated school. Um, but we're a neighborhood school, so we have um, kind of every um, socioeconomic level here, and we also have a very diverse population, um, and we have a very large special ed population um, here as well. Um, but Sockwell used to be the number one school in Bossier Parish, um, and um, over the years, the um, statement, we've always done it that way, kind of sank in. And um, so um, I was brought here from um, another school to kind of shake things up. And um, so that's what we've done. So I just kind of wanted to share our SLT process because it's really the base of everything that we do. Um, and it's really worked for us. So I'm gonna share my screen. It says I don't have abilities. Can you give me abilities, Kimberly? There we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Great. Okay, so this is this is one of my favorite quotes. It's just hope is not a strategy, luck is not a factor, and fear is not an option. And that's where we started. And I think it's you know especially applicable today. But our result was that we wanted everyone to be working towards the same goal. So our leadership team and admin team sets a major goal. And then all of the teachers SLTs are based off of that goal. And then the students are also tracking their goals. So all the stakeholders within the building are working towards the same school improvement. And so just like you talked about, we normally use that LEAP and K2 summative assessment data um, that we don't have this year. Um, so we gave some diagnostic testing at the beginning of the year. Um, we didn't really do it all at once. We kind of gave it in little pieces throughout the first couple of weeks because their brains kind of needed to be, um, you know, shook up and, and awoke at the beginning of the year. Um, and um, so that's the data. And we really just look at, is there a specific strand or standard that needs improvement? Um, and then what is our target improvement score for each assessment index? Um, so then uh, we define that focus. Um, this is an example of our test scores from a couple of years ago. And as you can see, we don't really have any glaring areas that we need to focus on. Um, so we kind of take a whole approach. Um, in this particular grade level vocabulary was an area that was a little bit um, lower. And so the teachers had an option to write one SLT for vocabulary and the rest of and their other SLT was kind of a whole picture. Um, and then um, we set the student learning targets. Our grade level, our leadership team um, sets a uh, percentage that they want to try to inc increase our assessment index by. And so in 2019, they decided that we would do a 3% increase. And so we set this goal based off cohort data. So um, our third graders cohort data for ELA was a 99.7. And so their goal was 102.7. Um, and then same thing for fifth grade, they also went up a 3% increase. And then we set our first and second grade um, goals to match and third grade to match that fourth grade. So that when those students get to third grade, 
um, they are already meeting that same standard and we don't have a lull behind. Um, now I'm not gonna lie, this is where our teachers um, freaked out on us the first year because when they see that number and a 3% increase, um, they did have a little bit of a freak out moment um, at first. Um, so then the teachers, we give them a spreadsheet um, and I just made up some names here, but this is an actual spreadsheet from my, uh, one of my teachers from two years ago. Uh, this is a third grade teacher. So she put in the second grade EOI assessment from the previous year and the leap diagnostic um, assessments. Um, we put that in and then the teachers assign a target um, achievement range. Um, and that, that target achievement range is going to be assessed on a summative that we create at the end of the year that mirrors the LEAP 2025. So we're not going to wait on that LEAP data, um, and we want to be a little more in control um, of that. Um, so we have created a, an achievement range based off of looking at our grade books and comparing that to the LEAP scores. Um, and so we just kind of came up with this achievement range. Um, I mean, it's not scientific, but it, it, it has worked for us. Um, and so the, the students at the end of the year are um, expected to score within that range. So then the teachers um, take their tallies of how many kids in each level. And you can see, um, this is when they felt more comfortable because when they put their scores in, they were actually projecting themselves higher than I was even expecting them to do. So um, they're just setting that bar really high. Um, and then, you know, formative assessment is so important. We talk about SLTs, but if you're not doing the formative assessment piece in the middle, um, before you get to that end of the year summit, analyzing your data and, and providing inter interventions, you're not going to hit that end mark. So this is a really big piece and this is where we spend the majority of our time focusing on is that formative data um, so that we can provide those interventions and enrichment. Um, like I said, we get our kids involved and we do the WIG process, the wildly important goal process. Um, we've adapted it from Leader and Me. Um, this is one example. Um, I believe this is a third grade ELA class. Um, this student was really struggling with test strategies and so the teacher gave her action steps. So the student is tracking what she can control um, herself uh, and what she needed to work on. And then she's also tracking that formative data. The red line is her target. And so she's every time they give a major formative assessment, she's tracking that to see where she stands. And then the students have accountability partners in their classroom. And you can see like this student left her accountability partner a note to, to check her work and use her calculator. Um, we caught these accountability partners helping each other on their homework on the playground during recess. Um, they take this pretty seriously, um, their accountability partner. And then of course we give um, checkpoints. We do it at the end of every nine weeks. Um, our teachers create summatives. Um, sometimes they will take, um, towards the end of the nine weeks, they'll take a, maybe a couple of formative tests that they're already given and then just add a little to it so that we're not spending so much time testing. Um, and we make sure that we help review over those summatives um, and that sort of thing. But our students are recognized for meeting those WIG goals at the end of each nine weeks. So your students who, you know, maybe their goal is a basic and they're making C's, but the previous year they were making D's and F's, they're getting that recognition and honor roll assemblies just like the kids who are making A's and B's um, are. So that has been a really important component. And so our teachers add in um, their checkpoint data every nine weeks. Um, we have the spreadsheet color coded so they can automatically see if these kids are meeting their goal. And for instance, like this student, Hannah, she, um, her score was a basic, but you can see the first nine weeks and the fourth nine weeks, she hit an advanced score. So there was something about the information in the second week and the third nine weeks that she wasn't getting, but because of that formative um, data, she was able to pick that up on the fourth nine weeks. 
So then they give an end of the year assessment at the end of the year. Again, this is a school created summative and they just determine whether their target was achieved. So they can just look back and forth. Um, and you can see this teacher, I just clipped it. She had four yeses and one no. And then they have to hit a range um, of how many students actually met their targets. Um, oh, wow. We have a couple of teachers who do social studies and science SLTs only. Um, and what we've done there is um, we're just using the assessments that they already have. Um, and again, we're looking at that baseline data and um, their target achievement level. And we're saying that they have to meet that level on five out of six of those units. So the teachers aren't giving extra assessments. They're just using that. And then kindergarten, we pick, um, they are uh, picking the, the, the uh, priority skills that they're teaching. And then every nine weeks assessing those and adding to them as they get more difficult. Um, and we're coming up with a, um, an average. So it's the same process. It's just a little different because it's kindergarten. Um, and just, you know, because of this process, you know, our teacher's knowledge of standards is better. Their planning practice is better. The teacher use of student, um, the teacher and student use of data has improved and our student mastery of standards has gone up. Therefore, their S our SPS has gone up. So just a little bit of our data. Um, we've had quite a bit of increase um, over the past several years. Um, and so probably can say we're the number one academic index in Bossier Parish again. So um, that's just kind of our um, our oh my gosh, that's great. So yeah, not to toot your horn, but toot toot. Like that's really <laughs> great. That's so exciting. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And from this point on, um, any more questions that you've got in the chat box, please put those in. Uh, but what I really want to highlight about this, Ms. Nolte, is number one, um, I think what we could really take away from what you just had, and if you could share any of that, that, yeah, of that attention to progress monitoring, because I would imagine that by the end of whatever that unit is, or by the end of whenever the, the, the period is for tracking data, there probably aren't a whole lot of surprises. Um, I also any. think it's super cool that, um, you know, the idea of accountability and the idea of really like focusing on metacognition with students, like them right. being in charge of their own learning. It's like you're yes. teaching them how to learn, not just teaching them content. And I well, think and if, if really they're looking space. at their action steps and they're completing those action steps and their scores still aren't improving, mm -hmm. they request a meeting with their teacher to change those action steps. So, um, you know, it's always changing, um, but it's, it's really worked yes. for us. It's, this didn't happen in one year. This was, you know, four years of tweaking. Um, and of course it's gonna have to be tweaked even more this year because of our circumstances. But, um, but the process will remain the same and our expectations will remain the same. So thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate too the variety of assessments that that these goals are made upon. So yeah. if you could, if there's anything you're willing to share in the chat box, and then I'll be reaching out to you sure. too so that we can get our FAQ document together with some more resources. But for um, those of you who are who are on the call, number one, I want to invite you to ask questions or share things. But I also want to invite you um, at this time over our next few minutes together, if you could put some topics in the chat box that we could create next month's office hours, they're all going to be completely organic to our time together here. So we do have a survey that's gone out, but I also know that on a school, as I, Jenny tells us, she's like, it's like drinking from a fire hose whenever you're um, a principal and we know that. So if you could just kind of throw in, what would you like to have a more elaborate kind of office hour on? And it might be one or two things, but that's how we'll form the basis of, of um, our contacts of experts to lead next month. And then I'm also gonna ask if you have any questions or again, topics, you can either unmute yourself now or you can um, just put them in the chat box we have any last comments from our speakers too, that would also be appreciated. Oh, that's a, that's a great topic, Ms. Dan. Okay. 
So any other calls for some needs that your school districts or schools might have, again, feel free to put that in so that we can um, formulate our next office hours to support those. Okay, so I know that sometimes people need think time and such, uh, but with our, our final two minutes, if our experts um, have anything more to add, I can only say thank you so very much. I know that to spend an hour um, is a very precious resource and we appreciate your time. We also appreciate your willingness and your love of our state to be able to spread your, be your best practices to others. Um, but if you have anything else to say um, for everybody on the call, that would be awesome and I'm sure appreciated. I'm just going to say thank you all for uh, for taking the time to listen to us. And I just posted in the box that I, I'm going to be meeting on Wednesday with um, the key teachers from all of my grades, and we're going to write our SLT document for this year. Um, and so I will share that with Kimberly so that it can be put somewhere near maybe um, the FAQ. And um, we're going to have more than more than one option. And so um, if you need anything, by all means, give contact. Me. I don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to work alongside you or um, or research or ask somebody else. Um, and my email is in the chat box, so. And I will echo Torrance's as well. We're still in the process of working at the school and district level. Um, we're still collaborating, discussing what our final options will be. But once those are, I'm uh, more than happy to share those with you all as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I put my email address in the chat box as well. Um, and I'm willing to send anybody any information that we have that may be helpful. Our master schedule, bell schedule, list of our teacher SLTs, anything that you all need. Again, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And anything that I can offer, you know, please reach out to me. I'll put my email in. And I see that you didn't have access to that document. I have lots of examples of those. Um, and I have the process. Um, written out in a flow chart if you need that too. Um, just let me know. Feel free to send me anything that you need. Okay, so to make sure that we respect your time, we're going to go ahead and call this um, office hours closed. If you would like to stay on to um, maybe type some questions that you didn't think of, or maybe um, you didn't want to really put for everyone, you're welcome to do that too. And again, I thank you all so very much. And I look forward to meeting with you next month and to make sure that we have topics that are, uh, that are relevant and timely for you and that you will consider helping us out um, and serving as one of our experts from the field. So have a great rest of your day and let us know if you need anything.